Kia ora guys, welcome back to my video lessons. This is the third video in the 2.6 ecology series. If you can hear a weird noise in the background, just ignore it. That's just my dishwasher um, doing its thing. So in this video, you'll be learning about habitats, adaptations, a concept called the ecological niche, and Gauze's competitive exclusion principle. And by the end of this lesson, you should be able to describe the three types of adaptations using examples, describe ecological niche in terms of habitat and adaptations using examples, and discuss Gauze's competitive exclusion principle using examples. Just to note that if you're watching this for the first time, please watch this on Edpuzzle and not YouTube. That's because I'd like you to complete the quizzes on Edpuzzle so that I can mark it online. All right, so before I can introduce the concept of ecological niche, I have to first describe what a habitat is and what an adaptation is. Let's start with habitat. A habitat is the place in which an individual organism lives. And this habitat is influenced by abiotic factors such as temperature, humidity, rainfall, and so on. Now remember in the last lesson, in lesson two, we learned that abiotic factors are non-living factors. So for example, Northland brown kiwis can be found inhabiting dense rainforests and damp gullies. And gullies are large ditches or small valleys that have been carved out by water. Now these Northland brown kiwis rely on their habitat being damp and the soil being moist because they feed on earthworms which are found in these damp and moist environments. So how do these animals actually survive in their habitat? They have adaptations. An adaptation is an inherited trait that gives an organism some kind of advantage in its habitat. It may be that this adaptation allows the organism to access resources in its habitat, such as food, or this adaptation helps the organism withstand the physical conditions, such as extreme wind or extreme temperature. Now there are three types of adaptations, structural, behavioral, and physiological adaptations. Structural adaptations. Structural adaptations are physical traits that help an organism survive in its habitat. In this picture, you can see the bottom trunk of a pukatia tree. The structural adaptation you can see here is called buttress roots. Buttress roots. If you didn't know, in structural engineering, a buttress is a triangular structure of brick, as what you can see in this picture. It's built in brick or stone that's built against a wall to strengthen the wall and stop it from falling over. Similarly, buttress roots, like this one, provide the Pukatia tree with structural support allowing it to grow up to 40 meters high. Behavioral adaptations. Behavioral adaptations are activities or actions an organism does to help it survive in its habitat. For example, cold-blooded skinks go out of the shade and bask in the sun to warm their bodies up and raise their body temperature to a level that's optimal for their metabolism. Because if they're too cold, their muscles won't be able to work and they won't be able to move very fast and get away from predators. Whereas if they warm their bodies up in the sun, then they're warming up their muscles and they're able to get away from predators more easily. Physiological adaptations are internal processes in an organism that help it survive. They are the biological or chemical processes that happen inside the organism or inside their cells. For example, the Venus flytrap right here makes pheromones inside its cells and release it into the environment. Now pheromones are chemicals that smell nice to some insects and some animals and these nice smelling um, chemicals lure the fly to the Venus flytrap. Okay, so now that we've learned about habitats and adaptations, we can talk about ecological niche. 
Ecological niche is a concept many students find difficult to understand, so please listen carefully. You can pause, rewind, and rewatch if you need to. And if you have questions, please ask me in class or email me. The ecological niche of an organism is the functional position of that organism in its environment. When I say functional position in the environment, I don't mean physical position in the environment. It's not about where the organism is literally located. What I mean by functional position is how the organism interacts with its environment. And this environment is made up of the habitat and the resources it gets from that habitat. So functional position means how this organism interacts with the physical conditions the resources available, and other organisms that may exist in its habitat. For organisms to be able to withstand physical conditions and for it to actually obtain the resources in its habitat, the organism needs to have certain adaptations. It's these adaptations that allow the organism to interact with its environment and therefore give an organism its functional position in its environment. I've created this diagram to visually represent the concept of ecological niche. As you can see, there are three different sized ovals. Big, me medium sized, and small ovals. The smallest oval is the individual organism, which lives inside a habitat, which is the second oval, second uh, largest oval. And this habitat is influenced by the physical conditions, which is this largest oval here. Now remember that the organism's ecological niche is its functional position in its environment. That includes how it accesses the resources in its habitat, like food and shelter. It also includes how it interacts with other species in its habitat. And on top of that, ecological niche includes how the individual tolerates the physical conditions in its habitat. And finally, one thing we want to include in the ecological niche is how often that individual breeds, how often it has, it makes offspring. So you can see that this animal, this individual, has specific adaptations to be able to carry out these functions. And these adaptations are represented by the arrows and the text in blue. So let's try this model on a New Zealand pest the brush-tailed possum. Its main habitat in New Zealand is the forest, which includes the Arataki forest we will be visiting next week. It loves living in the forest because the forest offers the brush-tailed possum so many resources. So let's describe the brush-tailed possum's ecological niche. Well, firstly, they produce one to two young per year, and they prefer to nest high up in hollow tree trunks. Their habitat can get quite cold, so they've adapted to have thick fur to keep them warm. While they nest high up in trees, they also have to withstand strong winds, so they've adapted to use their sharp claws and prehensile tail to grip and not fall from the tree. A prehensile tail is just a tail that has the ability to grip things with. So when are possums active? Well, they're nocturnal, which means they sleep during the day and hunt for food at night. They move up and down the trees and move across branches. To move up and down the trees and move across branches, they use their sharp claws and grip and stabilize themselves with their prehensile tail. They also use their sharp claws to access their food. As you can see in this picture, the possum is using its hands to hold its food up, it, up to its mouth. And its main source of food are leaves, but it also eats flowers, berries, and even birds, eggs, and chicks, making it an omnivore. So it's actually a predator to birds, eggs, and chicks, and its relationship with trees and plants is grazing. There's interspecific competition between possums, birds, and reptiles because they're all competing for flowers and fruit. But possums are much bigger than our native birds and reptiles, so they eat a larger proportion of food available in the forest habitat. And as you can see, that can be quite problematic for our native birds and our native reptiles. That's why we consider possums to be a pest. Now, a different way of understanding the concept of ecological niche is through asking these questions. 
How does the organism survive in its environment? When is it active? When does it eat? How does it get its food? Does it have any threats or predators? How does it avoid these threats or predators? What physical conditions or abiotic factors does it have to withstand? How is it adapted to withstand these physical conditions? And finally, what is its breeding rate? So I've taken what we discussed a couple of slides ago about possums to answer these questions. Now on to our last success criteria, discussing Gauss's competitive exclusion principle using examples. When two different species have very similar ecological niches, they're brought into direct competition, both species suffering as a result. But at the end of it all, one species will outcompete the other and force it to move out or go extinct. So what's Gauss's competitive exclusion principle? Well, this principle tells us that two different species cannot have the same ecological niche in habitat and happily coexist. That's because species with exactly identical niches also have exactly identical needs, which means they would directly compete for precisely the same resources. They would be directly competing for the same food, the same nesting sites, and so on. If this happens, one species will outcompete the other for these resources and cause the extinction of the weaker species or cause it to move out. A good example of Gauss's competitive exclusion principle is the interaction between two unicellular organisms. A unicellular organism is just an organism that's made up of one cell, so they're incredibly small and easy to grow in a lab. Now this unicellular organism is called Paramecium, and there's two species of Paramecium, Paramecium aurelia and Paramecium caudatum. When Paramecium aurelia and Paramecium caudatum are grown separately in the lab, so they're occupying different habitats, they both thrive when they're separate. That's shown in these two different graphs right here. When Paramecium aurelia is grown alone, they thrive. The trend line goes up. And when Paramecium caudatum is grown on its own, you can also see that the trend line goes up, it increases. We can see that the number of Paramecium aurelia and Paramecium caudatum cells increase as the time goes on. But when both the species of Paramecium are grown in the same habitat, in the same test tube, the number of Paramecium aurelia cells in green over here increases while the number of Paramecium caudatum in purple here decreases until there's absolutely none left. So when they're put in the same habitat, the two different species were directly competing for space and food. This intense competition harmed both species, but eventually one outcompeted the other to extinction. This is Gauss's competitive exclusion principle. Two different species cannot occupy the same ecological niche and coexist stably. So this Paramecium example happened in the laboratory, but in nature it's quite rare to see two species occupy the same exact identical ecological niches. But the greater the overlap in their niche, the stronger the competition is going to be between the two species. So now I'd like to check your understanding. Make sure you're doing this quiz on Edpuzzle and not on YouTube because I need to mark your results. Question 1. The ecological niche of a species is the place where its individuals live. A. True. And B. False. Question 2. Features must be heritable before they can be called adaptations. A true, b false. To attract birds, Nico palm berries are bright red. Birds eat the berries and poop out the seeds in different areas of the forest. Question 3. What type of adaptation is bright red berries? a structural, b behavioral, and c physiological. Question 4. Using what you already know about lions, write a brief description 
of a lion's ecological niche. You can give me about two to three sentences, please. The ecological niches of the native grey duck and introduced mallard duck overlap a lot. They inhabit similar habitats, have similar diets, and have similar adaptations. Mallard ducks on the bottom here with the green head are bigger than grey ducks and can physically bully them into competing for food. Mallard ducks also have a larger clutch size of 11 eggs. That's how many eggs they lay, compared to the eight eggs in grey ducks, our native ducks. Mallard males are also sexually aggressive and will interbreed with grey ducks to form fertile hybrids, so fertile offspring. Question five. Use this information to write a prediction on what will happen to the two species of ducks over time. One sentence is enough. Kapai, you've made it to the end of this lesson. So now you should be able to describe the three types of adaptations using examples. Describe ecological niche in terms of habitat and adaptations using examples. And discuss Gauze's competitive exclusion principle using examples.